What we're going to do uh, today is uh, the generalized continuum hypothesis in L. As I said before, this has been an unsolved, well, still is an unsolved problem since the beginning of the century, the turn of the eight, um, 19th, 20th century, and when Hilbert had announced at that Paris um, International Congress of Mathematicians in 1900, you know, this was the first problem on his list. So what Gödel shows is that the continuum hypothesis, 2 to the aleph 0 is aleph 1, or indeed the generalized version, 2 to the aleph alpha is aleph alpha plus 1, this holds in L. So we're going to use the condensation lemma, which uh, I proved in the last lecture. That's kind of a central feature of the proof of this theorem here. And it, it's used in, in mathematics, uh, sorry, in said theory, you know, constantly, right? So it's become a central feature uh, of said theory when you're discussing the constructible universe or indeed models like the constructible universe, which is a big part of said theory these days. So we're going to do uh, Theorem 418, this is on page 50, 59 right, of the notes here. So oh, before that, we'll make a we'll make a remark. <clears throat> uh, this is to say, if I prove a theorem in ZF, and I use the assumption that V equals L, right, and perhaps this proves some theorem phi, right, this theory. This is actually equivalent to saying that in ZF, I can prove that phi holds relativized to L. So we'll just argue, as, argue that in a moment. But the idea is that you know, this extra axiom here, or hypothesis, this assumes that the universe is all nice and regular. It has this L-like form. And this one here says that phi holds inside L. Well, we know that L is a model of V equals L. So it's quite plausible that this should be the case here. So <clears throat> so why might this be the case? Right? <clears throat> so if we assume the left-hand side here, We've also had, we've also shown, well, we've shown two things. We've shown in ZF that actually all the axioms of ZF hold relativized to L. And we also showed that the axiom of constructibility held relativized to L. So actually both of these things here, hold relativized to L. So now I could just use the um, soundness theorem. Yeah. I've got then that because from this theory I can deduce phi, and from ZF, I can deduce this theory. We have that from ZF, we can have phi and L. So, I mean, again, soundness theorem just says, if a collection of hypotheses T holds in a structure and from T, I can deduce psi, then I'll know that Psi holds in the structure. So here I've got 
that a theory here holds in the structure L, anything I can deduce from the structure, that also holds inside L. So that's the right-hand side there. Okay, so <clears throat> we assume ZF phi holds relativized to L. Actually, I'm not sure why I'm putting these brackets around it. Um, that was the official and easier notation. <clears throat> I mean, ZF plus V equals L, of course, proves V equals L. Right? So any formula chi relativized to L is just equivalent to chi, well, V equals L, chi relativized to the term V. But this is just equivalent to chi without any relativization. Restricting the quantifiers in chi to V is no restriction at all. So if from ZF I can prove phi holds in L, then certainly ZF plus V equals L proves that phi holds in L, right? And then I've got here that then this is just equivalent to phi. So this gives me this over here. So what often happens in proofs, and we'll do, well, the proof, we'll do this here, is that we want to show that something holds in L, phi will be the GCH. What we'll do is we'll assume ZF plus V equals L, and we'll just prove GCH. And we'll just prove GCH. Then we'll have that ZF alone proves that the GCH holds in L. Right, so that's how the logic of it goes. <clears throat> and the proof of the theorem is will be in slightly different notation. It always, as written in the text, the proof in the theorem always is talking about relativizations to L. Actually, it's more convenient to not keep writing these superscripts all the time and just assume V equals L. So it's just more convenient to assume. V equals L. So I don't have to make this change at all. So let's see what's the, the theorem say then. Are there any questions about that? So ZF proves This statement holds relativized to L. Any infinite cardinal kappa, L kappa is the same as H kappa. Right. And from that we'll deduce that F proves that GCH 
holds in L. And hence, as I've said in the well, as we were talking about above, that this is equivalent to this here. So as indicated in the note here, then I'm going to assume V equals L and prove, prove the result in ZF plus V equals L. And we'll just prove this statement here without relativizing to L. So that's the way um, the argument goes. Okay, so when kappa is omega, things are easy. Then we know that H omega, this is a hereditary finite set. We've already shown this. These we also call the hereditarily finite. Right, so Capri equals omega case is done. So what we'll do is we'll assume we've got a cardinal kappa bigger than omega. So again, it's one of these kind of arguments where you're trying to locate sets. The argument is saying that anything in H kappa is in L kappa. So let's have a picture. <clears throat> Here's my V, which is L under these assumptions. Ordinals up the middle. Here's Kappa. So what we're proving is that if there is a set X in H Kappa, right, it's not lying around up here, right? If it's hereditarily small, here are the L alphas, and here is L kappa. If it's in H kappa, it's not appearing in some later L alpha, it's down here. And we know the sizes of the L alphas, and so we can control the sizes of power sets. It's basically how it works. So we already know that the cardinality of L alpha is the cardinality of alpha. So if alpha is less than kappa, then the cardinality of L alpha is less than kappa two, down here. So this immediately says that L kappa is a subset of H kappa. So L alpha is in H kappa. It is a transitive set, so it's its own transitive closure, and it's got size less than kappa. So it gets thrown into H kappa. So all of the L alphas for alpha less than kappa are subsets of H kappa. So we have one direction of the inclusion here. The difficult part of uh, the theorem is to show the reverse inclusion. Okay.
So pick an X. in H kappa, pick an arbitrary X here. So what we'll do is find a sufficiently large alpha so that X, so I'll, I'll stick to the notation I've used in the notes, otherwise I might confuse us. Let's call it Z. So we'll find an arbitrarily large alpha where Z and its transitive closure exists, right? And here. So actually we'll take both Z and the transitive closure of Z here. These are both in L alpha. And we'll make sure that alpha is one of those ordinals to which the conjunction of axioms that we called sigma one earlier holds. And by the reflection theorem, sigma one holds in L alpha. <clears throat> right. So let's remind us what sigma one was. So that was that finite set of axioms. Of ZF plus V equals L, sorry, ZF. So that if sigma held inside some L beta, then every set was constructible inside L beta. And gamma to L gamma was absolute, again, for L beta. So this is the sigma one that was uh, mentioned in the lemma 422. So we do that so that the L alpha that we pick, then it thinks each of its sets lies in an, in an L beta. So it thinks V equals L here. Okay. So there's no problem with this, right? We assumed a Z was in H kappa. So that means it's transitive closure is in H kappa. Right? So TC of Z is in H kappa. And of course, so is singleton Z there in H kappa. So this shouldn't be needing saying by now, but let's make sure. So now we're going to apply the downward Lovenheim Skolem theorem to this L alpha here. So what we're going to do is if I just abstract L alpha out here, Here's, here's my Z and here's my 
singleton Z. So what we'll do is find an elementary substructure of L alpha, which contains just these two gadgets in. So I don't know quite exactly how, to, how one draws this. Often we just say, well, it's some um, something like, you know, some, like a subalgebra, it's a substructure of L alpha here, but which is elementary. So we apply the downward Lovenheim skolem So we find some elementary substructure X of L alpha epsilon. X here is this kind of vague uh, envelope here yeah, around those two dots. And what, what are we going to make sure is in it? TC singleton Z, I mean, this just is TC of Z union singleton of Z, the two things that we're interested in. So we'll make sure that these two things here, this is all contained in X here. And recall in the downward Lovenheim Skolem theorem, the idea is you may have a very large structure here. But this need only be as big as the gadgets that you insist on putting into it, at least if they're infinite. So we're going to make this X over here just have the same size as TC of Z. The point is we don't know yet the relationship between the cardinality of TCZ and, and L alpha. But we're getting there because we're constructing this substructure of L alpha, which does have the same size as TCZ. So this way we'll, we'll locate where TCZ and therefore Z is in the L hierarchy by looking at this structure here. And then we'll be applying the mostovsky shefferson collapse in a moment. So here, in the, in the downward Lovenheim Skolem theorem, we can insist that the size of X here when, if you look at the wording of the theorem, it's the maximum of the, the sizes of the things that we're putting into it. here and well aleph omega in the case that z was empty or finite so as long as z is infinite then this aleph zero is redundant here but the point is that kappa is bigger than omega right and we can assume then here that if we're of interest that this z is not in h omega you already know what happens there Either way, this is less than kappa. I mean, this could have size omega, for example, if Z is a subset of, of, of the naturals. So this could be omega in our setup here, uh, but it's less than kappa. Now, by putting in this here into X,
I know that the transitive part of X is going to contain all of this transitive set. Contains this transitive set as a subset. Yeah? So in the condensation lemma, and then at this point, we can apply the mostovsky shepherdson collapse to this. And if you recall, the mostovsky shepherdson collapse is the identity map on the transitive parts of X. So it's going to be the identity map on the things in here, including in X, the Z itself. Consequently, so the Mostovsky Shepherdson collapsing map pi used in the condensation lemma will be the identity when restricted to TC of Z here. So in particular, pi of Z is Z. Yeah. So Z is a member of this transitive set here. So that will be important in the argument that Z is not moved by this. <clears throat> so I'm going to collapse this envelope here, which is X by pi. And the condensation lemma says that the range of the collapsing map is an L gamma itself for some some gamma. When we look at the mostovsky shepherdson collapsing map pi right, here from this envelope down to some transitive structure, okay, this here is in the transitive part of X, so pi will be the identity on this transitive part of X by the proof of the mostovsky shepherdson collapsing lemma. So in particular, Z is a member of this, so pi of Z is Z. So overall, when we do this collapse here, we've got a pi which will collapse X to some transitive structure Y here. The condensation lemma says that this is some L gamma here. So this part here is, this is the, the collapsing lemma. This is the condensation lemma asserting that this transitive set in which all of the axioms of sigma one hold will, has to be an L gamma. Okay, for some gamma or other in, in ON. But we now estimate the size of gamma. This is an isomorphism, so it's a bijection. So the cardinality of this is the cardinality of this, which is the cardinality of this. So that's written down here. And this comes from our earlier work that we know the sizes of what the levels L gamma are. And this is all less than kappa because 
the cardinality of x was less than kappa. So what do I have? I have the pi of z here is in L gamma. And gamma is less than kappa. So this is contained in L kappa here. Hence, Z is in L kappa. Because pi is the identity. And that's exactly what we wanted to do, right, here. We wanted to take up here an arbitrary element from H kappa right, and show that it was in L kappa. We needed the reverse of this direction here. So as Z was arbitrary in H kappa, we have then that H kappa is contained in L kappa. And by the other conclusion that we had before, we've got their equal. So that finishes that part then of the theorem. Now we want to show that this gives us the GCH in L. And so we just count the number of elements in a power set. What do we want to show? We want to show that two to the kappa, which after all, this is the cardinality of the power set of kappa here. This is always the very next cardinal, kappa plus. For any infinite cardinal. But what have we just shown, right? Well, as two to the kappa is bijective with the power set of kappa, we've just shown, right? If I took a Z that was a subset of kappa in the above argument, right? Z might have size kappa, but it would be in H, not necessarily H kappa, but H kappa plus. So we have that the power set of kappa is contained in H of kappa plus. But we've just argued for any cardinals, this is the same in as L kappa plus here. So this is the crucial inclusion. The power set of kappa is contained in L kappa plus. So again, it's kind of worth a diagram here. Here might be L kappa plus, and here might be L kappa. And here's kappa. So what we've shown is that any subset of kappa occurs somewhere up here it doesn't occur higher up. Right? Any subset of kappa is in some L gamma for a gamma less than kappa plus. So the power set of kappa is delimited to this region here. So 
So just to spell it out. Thus every subset um, Z of kappa is in some L gamma for gamma less than kappa plus. Okay. So then the size of the power set of kappa right, is going to be less than the size of H kappa plus, less than or equal to the size of kappa plus, which is the size of L kappa plus here. And we know what this is, it's kappa plus okay, by previous work. So hence two to the kappa is less than or equal to kappa plus, which is the difficult direction here. This is the size, two to the kappa is the size of the power set of kappa. Okay, but by Cantor, Cantor's theorem, two to the kappa is bigger than kappa. The size of a power set is always bigger than the size of its set. Okay, so it's a cardinal bigger than kappa, it's at least kappa plus. So now these things are equal. And we're done. So this shows us the GCH then holding in L. Okay, I don't know if you want to center any, any questions there. Right, so now we'll get the relative consistency result just as we did before, but why don't I do it just one more time? But it's exactly the same as what we've seen. Corollary 419. So if ZF is consistent, then so is ZF plus GCH. just as before. You assume from ZF plus GCH, that you can prove phi and not phi. Okay. So we assume the contradiction here and we get a contradiction here. So here's the contradiction being proved from ZF if I add GCH. Okay. ZF, you've just proven that GCH holds an L. Okay. So our theorem we just did is entirely within in ZF. So we just showed this here. So by the soundness theorem, I have phi and not phi holds in L. And now it's just definition of relativization. I have phi holds in L and I have then that 
not phi holds in L. So I've got a contradiction. Well, I have a contradiction in ZF. In ZF alone. Okay, so mathematics is in no more danger of getting a consistency by assuming GCH than it was before. Okay. Let's see what to. Let's look at exercise four eight. Show that if there is a weakly inaccessible cardinal. Kappa then all the axioms of ZF, I've also written C as well here, hold in size L kappa. And ZFC does not prove there is a kappa such that kappa is weakly inaccessible. Now you might think that we've already proven this, but actually what we showed was in ZFC we proved there was no kappa, so the kappa was strongly inaccessible. If kappa was strongly inaccessible, okay, this implied, right, well it implied V kappa equals H kappa, but it also implied that that ZF C held in V kappa. So if those kappa was strongly inaccessible, it proved there was a model of all of the axioms. So in ZF C, we can't prove there is a kappa, the kappa is strongly inaccessible. That's not what this exercise is about. It's about weakly inaccessibles. So recall, strongly accessible means you know you're a regular limit cardinal closed under the power set operation. That closure under the power set operation isn't required to be weakly inaccessible. So, and there's a hint given to you. It says. Use the fact that GCH holds in L. Okay, so the actual solution then. So if Kappa is weakly inaccessible, then Kappa is regular. Being a regular cardinal is downward absolute to L. You can't have something that's a cardinal in V, but not a cardinal in L. It can't be that the cardinal is regular in V, but in L we have a function co-finalizing it with something smaller, because that function exists in V as well. So these are downward absolute. So 
So this weakly inaccessible cardinal is weakly inaccessible right now. Now we use the hint, right? What have we got? I've got some kappa here, which is a regular limit cardinal in L. But what have we shown? Precisely that power sets always occur by the next cardinal in L. So in L, Kappa is closed under the power set operation. So if any gamma is less than kappa and gamma is a cardinal in L, then the power set of gamma is contained in L gamma plus. So here would be a gamma, here would be the gamma plus. So this holds in L. So these are the cardinals of L below kappa. But what is that saying? That is saying then that kappa is closed under the power set operation. So actually in L, Kappa is not just weakly inaccessible, it's strongly inaccessible. So if it's strongly inaccessible in L, right, then that means that in L, L kappa is V kappa, is a model of ZFC. Which is part of what we're trying to go for up here. Right? And then that gives us the second part. In ZFC, we can't prove that there are structures in which ZFC holds, right? set structures in which ZFC holds. So in ZFC, we can't prove there's a weakly inaccessible. We can't prove there's a weakly inaccessible in ZFC because this will be giving us a strong inaccessible in L, right? and therefore a model of ZFC in L. does not prove um, this capus is capus weakly inaccessible. Okay.